Vibes. I always wanted to do experiments. What did the 2010s add up to? I spent the decade at Reason creating videos about the democratization of everything and the declining power of society's gatekeepers. Media theorist Marshall McLuhan, who coined the axiom, the medium is the message, argued that history's prime mover isn't the great leader or great thinker, but ever-changing communications technologies. Everything that we prize in our Western world in matters of individualism, separatism, unique point of view, a private judgment, all those factors are highly favored by the printed word and uh, not really favored by other forms. As societies moved from oral traditions to written ones, McLuhan argued there was a cultural shift. Tribal groups who relied on face-to-face -face communication and mythology morphed into more complex, less homogeneous societies, thanks to the written word. And when the printing press standardized communications, the distribution of literature created the very concept of a public, bound together by common languages and texts. This set the stage for the rise of modern nation-states in the Enlightenment millions of words across thousands of miles. In the 1960s, McLuhan identified our current epoch as the Electric Age, in which circuit-based media gave rise to what he termed the Global Village. For the first time in history, the entire world could follow a single event. McLuhan predicted that this electric global village would undo both the national homogeneity and personal individuality engendered by print, reviving our more fractured and tribal past. We're retribalizing. Involuntarily, we're getting rid of individualism. We're more concerned with what the group knows, of feeling as it does, of acting with it. And as the electric age has evolved into the digital age with its cheap, limitless replicability, this retribalization has accelerated in the 2010s. Which is why the past decade has both created opportunities and dangers for the libertarian and liberal worldviews. What we have already achieved gives us hope, the audacity to hope, for what we can and must achieve tomorrow. Barack Obama epitomized the best and worst of the decade. As a long-shot candidate, he used new modes of communication to route around and eventually co-opt media gatekeepers. He built a cult of personality through social media using inspiring rhetoric so vague that people could project anything onto his words. There are some who question the scale of our ambitions. They have forgotten what this country has already done, what free men and women can achieve when imagination is joined to common purpose. The Obama White House produced and distributed its own content, undermining the establishment's ability to define him. Photojournalists, for example, were denied access to the president's most intimate moments, but were free to publish the selective imagery of the official White House photographer. The White House went to create an identity for the president. And because they can distribute directly through all these different channels, there's really not much downside to it. There's not much accountability. Obama wasn't the only one who understood new media better than the gatekeepers. Disruptive figures like Andrew Breitbart. I'm here coincidentally, I just arrived. And James O'Keefe embarrassed the establishment, bringing down national political organizations like ACORN and Congressman Anthony Weiner, and casting doubt on media narratives about the emerging Tea Party movement. The same dynamic was at play when teenage boys were accused of harassing a Native American elder at the Lincoln Memorial until Reason's own Robbie Suave did a more thorough analysis of the raw cell phone footage. When you're reporting something that confirms all of your biases, you have to be really sure. You have to consider evidence that conflicts with that. Occupy Wall Street protesters capitalized on the digital age to gain widespread attention for their movement. And of course, there's Edward Snowden, who carefully selected his own gatekeepers to bring U.S. government secrets out into the open and then spoke directly to the public to defend his actions. Over time, that awareness of wrongdoing sort of builds up and you feel compelled to talk about it. DIY culture is hardly new, but the 2010s are when journalists, governments, and the public at large were forced to take it seriously renegade gunsmith Cody Wilson created not just the 3D printed gun, but just as importantly, content about the 3D printed gun. If you only knew the terribly like embarrassing, vulnerable like physicality of these things, these objects would just crumple and fall apart. So the media cannot help themselves. If I can get something 80% of the way, they will take it to its completion, and then a bit further than that. Wilson also epitomized the permissionless attitude that accelerated in the 2010s by enabling his customers to make firearms without the involvement of the state. We're trying to push through facts on the ground that change what the political reality is, independent of our institutions. Hopefully one day it won't matter 
what these men and women in black robes say because you just know that you can download the AR-15 from the internet, crank one out in your garage, crank two out in your garage. Or take DIY genetic engineering kits, pioneered by former NASA biologist turned biohacking entrepreneur, Josiah Zayner. Are people dying and suffering needlessly because of all these committees and all these rules? And what happens if people just start saying like, fuck you, I'm gonna do it anyway. And what if people start getting cured? Ross Ulbricht launched the first, but not last, dark web drug market. Is this about punishment? and making him an example. And Uber, Lyft, and Airbnb disrupted and undermined entrenched industries with ubiquitous pocket computers. You cannot cope with vast amounts of information in the old fragmentary classified patterns. You tend to go uh, looking for mythic and structural forms uh, in order to manage such complex data and so moving at very high speeds. If Obama mastered the use of new media to control image and messaging, Trump exploited its tendency to discombobulate and retribalize. He probably will win the presidency based just on skill. Cartoonist and writer Scott Adams predicted a Trump victory more than a year before the election after observing his persuasion tactics. It's more of a strategy than you imagine it is. I've said that if Trump wins, it might change how we see the world, not just how we see politics, but how we see humans and how humans are influenced and how little reason has anything to do with what we do. Political scientists will debate the various reasons for Trump's victory for years, but with his background in reality TV and mass marketing, there's little doubt out, he excels at making himself heard by an American public stretched thin by an increasingly overwhelming flow of information. Trump's concepts and phrases stick in our minds. Very, very low energy. More energy tonight. I like no, you are fake, fake news. Phony. The dishonest fake. media. The dishonest what media. What the hell is going on? There's something going What's on going and it's on bad. In Chicago. It's a witch hunt. About the witch this hunt? is a hoax. Total hoax. Foreign actors capitalized on the declining trust in institutions to spread their own propaganda. So it's not surprising that many people yearn for the return of the gatekeepers. All this hate and violence is being facilitated by a handful of internet companies that amount to the greatest propaganda machine in history. Congress demanded that Facebook, Twitter, and Google do something. The gatekeepers tried to reassert power. Twitter and Google punished users for violating their vague and overly broad terms of service, which were partly exported to the U.S. from more censorious jurisdictions. Things that would be politically difficult and perhaps unconstitutional, or in some cases certainly unconstitutional, to mandate here, we don't have to even consider because they get mandated in Europe and then companies apply them globally. The medium is not something neutral. It, it does something to people. It takes hold of them, it roughs them up, it massages them, it bumps them around. But if McLuhan is right, there's no reverting to the old days. His technological determinism will seem bleak to some, but his analysis also offers a path to personal agency and self-awareness. If you take some violent and irritating process, say like radio or TV, and start looking at how it works, what it's doing to you and why it's doing it to you, you can get very enthralled, very excited. What kind of media do you want? Not what kind of press or set of journalists, but through what technological means do you want to communicate and get information? If the 2010s were the decade of the stream or the feed, what if the 2020s bring the return of the channel? Content giants like Netflix and Disney are in a mad scramble to lock their copyright behind subscription paywalls, roughly reconstituting the branded TV channels that cord cutters thought they'd left behind. But they're also part of a consequential shift towards deriving revenue from subscriptions instead of advertising, which generates a more direct relationship between content consumer and producer. And we've already begun to see dedicated encrypted communication channels supplant public timelines and further fracture mass media. Following the habits of its users, even Facebook has pivoted hard away from the news feed towards private groups and chat. Could the revived channel, with its emphasis on personalization and constant exchange, signal a return of community, privacy, and free thought in the 2020s? Or will the 2020s see the continued erosion of those values in which we turn our major communications platforms into public utilities, heavily controlled by the state. If we begin to treat media consumption as a personal responsibility, with awareness of how electric media predisposes us to tribalism and opens new pathways of manipulation, we can better opt out, resist, and persuade others to do the same. 
If things go well, the next decade could present new opportunities to spread ideas free of needless gatekeeping and to carve out more robust spaces, physical and virtual, away from prying eyes and heavy hands. Spaces where individualism, free thought, and experimentation can flourish. If not, society could be destabilized in the 2020s, or perhaps we'll see a new, more pernicious form of gatekeeping, like the techno-authoritarian control mechanisms being developed in China. In that scenario, the only recourse will be to turn more urgently to state-resistant encryption tools and decentralized internet platforms. A decentralized framework where there isn't that middleman that can be manipulated or coerced or regulated into exposing your data. That's a better, safer, more resilient world, which doesn't end up in this case where it's susceptible to authoritarian manipulation control. The future demands a greater commitment to liberal tolerance of difference and the fair and free exchange of ideas. But the coming decade, with its opportunities to leverage the tools that for so long were out of reach for so many, could and should be a time of liberation, choice, and prosperity, rather than one of collectivism, control, and misery.